you are made more whole by closing it, right? So uh, I noticed that Halloween is coming. <laughs> Did you notice that too? So uh, knock knock. Yeah. Philip. Hello. Fill up my bag with Halloween candy, please. <laughs>
the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, our hearts are in other people. You are always ready to hear our cries. Teach us to rely day and night on your faith. Grant us your
beautiful wildflowers across a tiny stream, continually going up very gradually. And as you come out of the wildflower field, about three quarters of a mile in, you begin to go up, <laughs> seriously up. We're already at an elevation of almost 10,000 feet. So you're already hopping and puffing a little, right? Then we start up a windy switchback trail to get to the top. So we huff and puff. I huff and puff more than Art does. And we huff and we puff and we stop as often as we need to. And a little way we think, I can't do this. And then there's, oh, but at the top, oh, let's just persevere a little more. And a little more, and a little more, up the switchbacks, huffing and puffing, stopping when we need to, until we crest at the top. And when you get to this mesa at the top, you can see for miles, lakes, rivers, other mountains, sometimes snow up there to play in and throw snowballs at each other. And the persevering walk has all been worth it. Even when at some points I thought I have to t talk myself into this and not lose heart and turn back. We've made it. Now you're thinking right now of other stories of persevering and making it. Not just about hiking, but about other kinds of things. Sometimes praying for something for a long time. Maybe till someone overcomes a drug or alcohol addiction. Maybe for a war to end. Maybe sometimes other things for a long time. You persevere in prayer and finally, finally, you crest and see what's beyond the struggle. It helps us to remember this quote that I saw recently. Some of the best days of your life haven't happened yet. Keep going. <laughs> On the surface, this parable of Jesus is about persevering in prayer, about not losing heart, in the midst of a challenging and difficult circumstance. It reminds me of this story. You remember Mother Teresa? She was canonized as a saint in 2016, almost 20 years after her death at, at age 87. Over the years of her hard work among the poorest of the poor in Calcutta, she made many trips to raise awareness and money for her cause. And lots of stories have been told about her, of course. Preacher Tom Long once told a story about a time when Mother Teresa was in New York City to meet with the president and a vice president of a large company. Before the meeting, however, the two executives had privately agreed not to give her any money. Eventually, the tiny little Mother Teresa arrived and she was seated across a large conference table from the two men, separated by a very large desk. They listened to her and then they said, well, we appreciate what you do. We just cannot commit any funds at this time. Let us pray, Mother Teresa said. <laughs> she then asked God to soften the hearts of the men. After saying amen, she renewed her plea, and they renewed their answer that they were not going to commit any money. Let us pray, she said yet again. <laughs> At which point, the executive relented and asked for a checkbook. <laughs> you see, one important meaning about the story of Jesus is to persevere in prayer, even when it's difficult, even when it's challenging. Yet there is another level to this story which Jesus intended us to see and explore. Jesus loves to tell stories like this that have a surface meaning, a very important surface meaning, and then challenges us to go deeper into his heart and see even more to the story. 
This is another kind of strange and sometimes confusing story told by Jesus, one of a number of them. It's a parable, a simple story with a deeper meaning. Here we go with it. We're going to go deeper into the heart of Jesus into, and into ours. You see, the writer of Luke includes lots of stories about those who are on the fringes of society. The widows, the sick, women in general. These are some of the people who followed Jesus religiously, and he wanted to encourage them by telling the stories. In Luke 18, we find Jesus telling this story. This is a story that Jesus is telling his disciples, his closest followers, just before he had been talking with the Pharisees, with the religious leaders, about the coming of the kingdom of God. But then he turns just to his followers, his closest disciples, and he says he is about to tell a story about their need to pray always and not lose heart. He starts out telling them what he's going to tell them. They must have needed encouragement after Jesus debates with the Pharisees. So he tells them what he's going to talk about. Your need to pray always and not lose heart. And then he says, in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. It feels to me like a story that begins, I'm going to tell you about somebody I once knew when everybody there knows who that friend is, right? He had just been talking with the Pharisees who were known to be rigid and trying to trap Jesus. Then Jesus says, there was this judge that neither feared God nor had respect for people. Is that how judges are supposed to be? <coughs> Disrespectful of God and people? <coughs> Jesus goes on, in that city, we don't know where, there was a widow who kept coming to the judge and saying, great <coughs> justice. And I picture that each time before she steeled herself to go once again to the judge, she might have prayed Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. And by the saying of that, the praying of it, she had the courage to go. I want to say about, a bit about widows in Jesus' day. They are among the least in society. Not able to care for themselves unless they have sons or other men to care for them in Jesus' day. Leaders are directed by scripture to care for them. To not take advantage of them. To provide for them. <coughs> But this judge, we know, has no respect for scripture, or God, or the woman. We don't know why this woman was coming, seeking justice. Had she been harmed, cheated, stolen from, refused food? We just don't know. She comes seeking justice. The meaning of the word justice in this passage is this. The word for justice is found throughout this parable, and this is not the generic form for justice. The term here is found in a number of passages that describe acts of retribution or vengeance. Justice for a person who has been seriously harmed who has been victimized. The word, this word for justice in the Greek appears in various places in scripture when someone has been seriously harmed, unjustly harmed, and is seeking justice from the one who did that. It's a powerful word that's being used in this passage. The widow in the passage is seeking to be vindicated. She desires that the judge punish the one who has unjustly wronged her. It's a large claim. We don't know what happened, but we know it's serious enough that she keeps coming, seeking punishment for the one who has unjustly wronged her. You with me? 
Then we hear, for a while the judge refused to even hear her, but later he said to himself, you heard this a minute ago. Though I have no fear of God, no respect for anyone, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so she may not wear me out. Listen to that. <laughs> he didn't act justly because he had a change of heart. She wore him out. He didn't want to see her anymore. So he did what he needed to do to get rid of her. Can you imagine how Jesus said this part of the story? His tone of voice, his inflection. This is from another translation. For a while, the judge refused. But he finally said to himself, I don't fear God or respect people, but I will give this widow justice because she keeps bothering me. Otherwise, there will be no end to her coming here and embarrassing me. Jesus concludes the story. Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping? I tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? We get that Jesus is telling his followers to persevere in prayer and not lose it. We get that. Yet I think there are other reasons he tells this story about the judge and the widow. There's a deeper layer, one that cuts all the way to the heart. Do we know those who have been unjustly treated, especially those who suffer at the edges of society? Do we know those people? Do we get tired of hearing the cries for help, like the judge? We may not be faithless or cruel, but do we get weary of hearing from those who suffer? Or can we find ourselves in the words of the widow, seeking justice for ourselves at some time in our lives? And having to plead again and again for help, maybe with the medical system, medical issues, maybe in the courts, maybe with other places or systems or with people, have we ever found ourselves <coughs> seeking something for ourselves that is badly needed? What do you take from this parable of Jesus today? As we've said, on the surface, it's about persevering in prayer. Take heart from Jesus' parable, that if an unjust judge can grant the widow what she needs, how much more will a loving God grant what we need when we need it? It just may not be our time or the way we desire, but God will hear us as our God is just. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord. And this parable challenges us to go into our hearts and ask, who is the modern day equivalent of the widow? And see if there are ways we are thinking or acting at one time or another like the unjust judge turning from those who need help, or perhaps helping grudgingly rather than with an open heart. Jesus gives us the chance through the story to have our hearts open to turn to be as Jesus desires. Isn't that sweet? He gives us that chance. One of the things Jesus is always trying to show through his stories, through his actions, is what the right response to suffering in our world should be. And it is not to grudgingly try to get rid of those who are struggling. It is, as Jesus says, God does, 
to heal the sick, to reach out to the hurting, to be the conveyor of God's love and God's grace. Then you know what? God will be with us as we seek to help those most in need. Jesus encourages our hearts to hear him through our persevering in prayer. If we are suffering and need God's help, a gracious God will grant you what you need. Or Jesus encourages us, God will shift our hearts if we need it, to hear the cries of those in need, and God will be with us, encouraging us through it all. What if we not only persevered in prayer, but also persevered in doing good, unlike the judge in this story? Then perhaps Jesus would tell the parable like this. In southern Arizona, says Jesus, there was a group of Christ followers who feared God and respected people. In their city, there was a poor woman who came to people and said, someone has harmed me, taken all I have, and left me in tears and hurting. Please help me find justice for what has happened to me. And Jesus goes on. At first, the people didn't listen very well to her, but she kept coming to them. Finally, they looked closely at her and at one another and saw her suffering, and together they said, let's do all that we can to help her have clothing and food and legal help to find the one who harmed her. And Jesus would say, blessed are those who help those who struggle. As much as they did that, will not God do even more? And perhaps do even more through them? Yes, says Jesus, I think I found faith here in southern Arizona among the Christ followers, among those who seek justice for the hurting, and I will give them even more of my heart. And remember, some of the best days of your life haven't happened yet. Keep going. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to rise as you're comfortable in the room. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
to lead us into this time, a time of coming to Christ's table, where through the bread and the cup we are strengthened and made more whole and connected to Christ and to one another in new and powerful ways. So you are invited today to the communion table. Oh, please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. You know, I think you can sit back down. I'm sorry about that. Go ahead and sit down. Because I think for those of you, especially in the back, it's hard to see anything up here if you're standing. So may God be with us as we enter into this time of Holy Communion. We remember that on the night before he died, Jesus was with his closest followers, his friends, the ones to whom he addressed the parable that we heard today. And they had a last meal with him before he was betrayed and then taken to be killed the next day. And while they were at the meal, he gave them something that has endured through time. He gave them a holy meal. At a certain point, Jesus took bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his friends, and he said, Take and eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Every time when you eat of this, remember me. And when the supper was finished, he took a cup, and he passed it around to them, and he said, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of your sins. Every time when you drink of the cup, remember me and that you are becoming part of me through the drinking of the cup. And then we pray, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, 
one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at the heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. With the confidence of the children of God, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For I is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite the communion servers to come. And as they're coming, I remind you that all are welcome at this table. There will be two stations. The ushers will bring you, usher you forward and give you the opportunity to have a wafer and dip it in the cup and partake in that way.
and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. How nice it is to look out and see you today and welcome you. You can tell that the temperature is cooling because we're putting out more and more rows of seats on Sunday morning. 127, almost 130 people this morning. That's wonderful. Oh, that's wonderful. So good to see you today. I do have a few ministry reminders and announcements. Uh, one is, uh, we are so blessed with lovely music from our Saddlebrook singers and also certainly from Susan and Joan. The prelude is a part of our worship experience, and so maybe you notice today, inside the first page, before the prayer, where it says prelude, there's a red line at the top. Thank you for turning off your electronic devices. But I also added a second line, just as a reminder to us that worship begins when the prelude starts. Because it's lovely to ease into worship together in that time of prelude and to hear a beautiful selection of music. So I encourage you to uh, listen carefully to the, to the prelude each Sunday. Julie Egolf, uh, come up here and talk to us again about the collection of warm coats and jackets because the temperature is dropping little by little. And there's so many people who don't have warm clothing. Um, I figure by the first part of the week of November, the elevation of Saddlebrook is going to lift because so many people have donated clothing. <laughs> but we can still use more. Now, if there's a note in here. The trouble is the address is incorrect. It's 37663 South J. Crest. If you go up Brassy, turn on J. Crest, four houses in. If you go Hallis Highway, turn right, and it's three and a half houses down. So it's easy to find. Just stick it in my uh, porch and feel good about yourselves and think about how good other people are going to feel with your donations. So thank you. Thank you, Julia. The collected warm attire, uh, I understand, is going to go to St. Vincent de Paul, uh, and that's a wonderful place in Midtown that really supplies a lot of the uh, emergency needs uh, for people. So I hope you'll be generous in, as you go through your closet and pull out those warm items. I have a copy of the Vision, which is the church's newsletter, lovely cover today, and there are a whole stack of these in the back. If you want to know more than you need to know, probably, <laughs> or want to know, if you'd like to know anything about the life of the church and the ministries, it's contained in this little volume. Pick one up on your way out today. They're at the, uh, in the entryway just as you make a turn toward the front door. I know that uh, the numbers are increasing, and I'm so glad to see people coming back. Uh, for instance, the Cleghorns. Where are you to see them? Right here toward the front. And over there, and over there, and over there, because they brought half of Des Moines with them. <laughs> Family members, and we're glad to see you. And guess who else is back here? I'm so glad to see Jim Vadas and Anita. Pastor Jim, just uh, start writing sermons now, Jim. Get ready. Because you're, you're going to be up very soon. If you would like to volunteer and help in the worship service, we're always open to that possibility, particularly in ushering and greeting or in the reading of scripture, or in uh, the uh, sharing of prayer together. If you would like to do that sometime on a rotating basis, we have some sign-up lists in the back, and be very happy for you to peruse those and see where an open date is, and take advantage of that opportunity to serve in the worship. It's a blessing to be with you today, and to share this time with you, and uh, we will rise together, and we will have a benediction. Receive this benediction. God who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen.
communion, blessing one another as we send one another forth. Called by God's Spirit, we are to be the presence of Christ in our daily lives so that others will follow him. Go in peace with Christ beside you. Thanks be to God.